Thank you everyone for coming. Um, the first time I tried to come to the Center for Inquiry, that was about early 2000, I was denied a visa. So is, um, this is about 20 years coming now. So, so I'm happy I made it. <laughs> I'm happy I'm here at last. Um, I want to tell you why what you are doing here is important. That is, that is really my mission here. I want to tell you, yeah? Yes, I want to tell you why what you are doing here is important. And, uh, but I will start with the title of my presentation, which is Mubarak Bala and Assault on Free Inquiry in Africa. Something is wrong with Islam as practiced and professed in Nigeria. Something is wrong with the Mohammedan version of the Abrahamic faith. This religion, which those who enslaved or colonized Africa introduced in furtherance of their imperialistic agenda is holding people hostage. And as you can see from there, these are children, schoolgirls, that Boko Haram members kidnapped. You have them on one side. And on the other side, you have what they call Hijba, the Sharia police, destroying bottles of beer, alcohol, because they said it was, it was forbidden. So you see the government in Northern Nigeria, they collect value added tasks from this alcohol. And at the same time, they are funding uh, Sharia police, destroying the, the alcohol. So that's, a, that's the kind of situation we find ourselves. Something is out of step with the attitude of a critical mass of Muslims in Nigeria, their perception, representation, and reckoning with their religion and their prophet. They keep telling us that they love their prophet more than they love their own parents and more than they even love themselves. They tell us that openly. And sometimes they don't want you to actually respond or say what you think about that. In this presentation, this vicious manifestation of Islam in Africa's most populous nation will be situated. And I use the case of Mubarak Bala to illustrate this religious anomaly and is this disturbing disconnect from civilization and reason. I'm drawing attention to the hampering effect of dogmatic fits on the progressive emancipation of the African mind. And here I argue that the pernicious impact of Islam stays us on the face. The Islamic wrongs, whether inspired or motivated, sanctioned or sanctified by the teachings in the Quran or in the Hadith, the Sunni and, and Shia formulations, or by the largely opinionated pronouncements by clerics, sheikhs, imams, mullahs, and other earthly self acclaimed Mohammedan and Allah incarnates need to be critically examined. I propose that these wrongs constitute an insult on free inquiry and an existential threat to humanists and human beings, including Muslims in, in 21st century, in 21st century Nigeria, and by extension, Africa. Now, this is Mubarak Pala. He came out as an ex-Muslim in 2014. Now, when we use the phrase coming out, that means that to exit Islam is a struggle. In this case, a life and death struggle. Renunciation of Islam comes at a price, a huge price. It leads to structural and physical death. In response to to his living Islam, family members took Bala 
to a mental hospital. I mean, who does that? Is apostasy a disease? Now to his family members and many Muslims, Bala should be out of his senses to have renounced the faith of his fathers and to have done so openly and publicly. Apostasy is a disease according to Islam as practiced and professed in Northern Nigeria. So Bala needed some treatment for his own belief. So people in the region have made us to understand that his family members were kind. They were kind to him. That they took him to a hospital to protect him and to provide him an opportunity to reconvert and to recover. So hospitalization was an exercise in Islamic protection, kind and merciful treatment as understood in Northern Nigeria. Now, family members wanted to prevent him from being murdered by the foot soldiers of Allah and that operate with impunity in the region. They did not want him to suffer the same faith as uh, the same faith as Deborah Samuel, whose Muslim schoolmates murdered in cold blood for making what they call blasphemous statements on the WhatsApp group platform. They did not want him to be also murdered or killed like Pastor Shuaibu and, uh, and Mrs. Abahime and other victims of Islamic uh, bloodletting in the country. By the way, as in other cases linked to allegations of blasphemy, those who murdered these individuals have yet to be brought to justice. Yes, even though it was publicly done. And you can see from the slide there, this young man was showing the matches box they used to set the cops of, uh, of, um, of uh, Deborah ablaze. And up to today, nobody is being tried for, you know, for murder and they just want the whole matter to die out. The same thing applies to the case of Shuaibu. So Bala's family took him to a state hospital, which is in a Sharia implementing region, an extension of the Islamic faith clinical enterprise. A part of the Malamic, Imamic, Shekist, Ulamaic rehabilitation centers that operate in the region. Many of these uh, clerics, they operate what they call rehabilitation centers. So if you are found wanting in terms of your faith, they take you there. So these state hospitals now, they have become an extension of these rehabilitation centers. So from, from his hospital bed, Bala reached out to the humanist community and humanist colleagues around the world, including Center for Inquiry members rallied and campaigned and Bala was released from the hospital. Now, Bala has not been the only humanist in Africa so affected, so declared as mentally sick for leaving Islam. Now, this is Mohammed Sali from Sudan. Mohammed changed his status to non-religious in his national identity card and he was accused of apostasy. But a judge acquitted him after declaring that he was mentally incompetent. So for them, it is only when somebody is mentally incompetent that you can accommodate and tolerate the person leaving Islam or openly professing or declaring that the person is an atheist or a free thinker or saying something critical of Islam. So Bala became a free man, but it was only for a short time because Islam as practiced in Nigeria has no place for freedom, free thought, freedom of expression and free inquiry. The Islamic faith is opposed to liberty and open-mindedness. The Nigerian Islam is antithetical to human rights and equality before the law. It sanctions oppression and persecution and deploys physical and structural violence against real and imagined religious orders, non-believers, dissenters, and inquirers. The Islamic religion largely thrives on fear, force, and intimidation, especially in sections of the country 
where Muslim adherents are in the majority. So it is in these Muslim majority communities, such as Balas Kanu State, and of course, Mohammed Salih Sudan, that political Islam is enforced. Sharia is being enforced. Islamic policing takes place and Boko Haram militants are on rampage. Now, Bala is of the view that to free Nigeria from the chokehold of political Islam, its doctrines and traditions, the life and teachings of its prophets need to be critically examined. Perceived conflicts and contradictions need to be highlighted. Islamic absurdities need to be foregrounded and analyzed. Muslims and non-Muslims need to speak freely of the religion and critically examine Quranic injunctions. Incidentally, Muslims in Nigeria are largely opposed to these sentiments. They are intolerant of debate. They respond violently to any supposed blasphemous or sacrilegious look at their religion and its prophet. They designate these expressions as insults and violations of their sensibilities as provocations and justifications to take up arms, to bloodlet, attack, or murder any real or imagined violators or provocators with impunity. Meanwhile, the Quran is filled with verses that demean religious and irreligious orders. Young Muslims are made to recite and memorize injunctions, verses that non-believers consider and could consider as offensive. Now, the Quran justifies hatred and violence against non-believers, religious dissenters, and free inquirers. Islam embodies a sacrilegious outlook or a sacrilegious look on Christianity, African traditional religion, and other prophetic and cosmological outlooks. And it accords other faith icons and inferior status. They used to tell us that in Nigeria that Islam is a perfection of all religions. And their prophet, that is the peak of prophethood. There was nobody after him. So because he's the greatest. And you know, they make these declarations. They expect somebody who has an active mind not to say anything. So, but it's pertinent to note that Islam did not start or did not originate in Africa. It was a religion that, it, that was introduced from outside. It's an Arabic religion and owes its spread in Africa largely to indoctrination, violent attacks, and criminalization of apostasy and blasphemy. Yes, they made it a crime. You, when you convert, you don't leave. In fact, I was told that if you're a Muslim, you're a Muslim for life. And I was wondering why. Now, you can't leave. And even if you leave, you don't openly say your mind or what you think or why you left or what you think is wrong with the religion. So Islam is like, it entered Africa, and in places where it get dominance, the Islamic establishment shut the door. So it's just like somebody coming into this apartment and now shuts the door. No, no other person should enter and no other person should go out. That's exactly the situation we have in Nigeria. So, so it shut the door against freedom, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, freedom of belief, free inquiry, free, free mind, it unleashed tyrannical and totalitarian tendencies on the people. Islam, Islam holds individuals socially and intellectually captive. They force young girls to dress on hijab. They penalize them. We can see what's going on in Iran. Now, while, while the young ones, the young girls in Iran are rebelling, now the establishment in Nigeria, Islamic establishment are trying to force all young girls to dress just like we saw on the slide. Now, Bala tried to change the status quo. After leaving the hospital, he continued to post comments and share thoughts on social media that we are critical of the religion and its prophet. And in April, 2020, some Muslims who have been censoring Bala's post on social media petitioned the police. They claimed that his Facebook post and comments were blasphemous and offensive to Muslim religious sentiments and sensibilities. And based on the petition, the police arrested Bala. And this is what, you know, uh, part of the things they said on the petition that he sent 
He said some stuff calling the prophet of Islam denigrating names like ped pedophile, terrorist, among other, others, and that that could provoke them to take laws into their hands and which might ultimately result in public disturbance and bridge of peace. And you know, look at what what's go goes on. They have mosque and have these loud speakers. If you have gone, maybe some people who have been to Nigeria or something, follow the religious practice in Nigeria, and they will be using that. They don't care about whether it's a neighborhood where people are sleeping, and they will be shouting and declaring their faith openly, say what they think about their prophet, but they don't want other people to say what they think, not only of their prophet and also of other prophets and Islamic teachings. So, Based on the petition, the police arrested Bala. They held him in Comunicado for several months. He told me that they kept him in a room, only him, in a room for months. And they will come there. They only give him food when they want to give him food. They only, have a, they only allow people to, call, only the people are allowed to see him for months. We had to go to court. Now, later they charged him in a court and the Quasar Sharia court convicted and sentenced him to 24 years in prison after he pleaded guilty to the charges. Yes, that's the issue. He pleaded guilty. Now, Bala pleaded guilty. So that was at the court session with his lawyer. Bala pleaded guilty after a sham trial in Kano. He pleaded guilty after almost two years of, of no guilty plea, psychological torment, arbitrary detention, threat to his life and his lawyers, harassment, intimidation, and coercion to reconvert to Islam. He pleaded guilty because his captors left him with no other option. It was either he either a, a guilty plea or death and disappearance. They kept threatening him that he was not going to go out there alive. He should better accept what he did. And they even approached us, they asked us to apologize. And I was telling them, apologize for what? Yes, because I couldn't understand what Mubarak did that deserve any apology. Because if there's anything, he said what he thought. And I think what he, what he said is, is, is okay. I mean, somebody who went around killing others who did not believe, you know, who did not subscribe to his own faith and, and believe, I mean, can be described today as a terrorist. Yes, and we are using a term today. And somebody who married an underage or a girl who took... He's a pedophile. It doesn't matter whether it's Prophet Muhammad or another person. Yeah. And, we, and what is wrong with that? That is your view. And if you disagree, you can, they could come around and provide evidence that the man or did not you know, carry out terrorist activities or did not engage in, in pedophile or, or sorry, in pedophilia. He did not do that. So, but instead of doing that, they went and arrested him. So, so he pleaded guilty after almost two years of no guilty plea. And, um, and at the end of the day, he was convicted. He's serving, you know, 24 year prison sentence as we speak. So we have appealed the, we're appealing the judgment and we are hoping, you know, to see what could be done to overturn the ruling. So Africa and the world, need a vibrant culture of free thought, free inquiry and expression that includes free expression of ideas and thoughts about Islam and his prophet. Yes, we must speak freely about this religion if we are really going to get out of this mess. We must be mindful of the mischievous use of Islamophobia to sustain the privilege of Islam. I know that is, that's, it features a lot here in the West. Anytime you want to say something about Islam or Muhammad, they start shouting Islamophobia and everybody, you know, pulls back. Yeah. But we need to say what we think about Islam and, the, and Muhammad. I think that it is very quite consistent, especially for people in my region where Islam has been a weapon, a device for persecution and oppression. So we... We, we, we have to be mindful of the, of, the of the mischievous use of Islamophobia to shut down debate and undermine critical examination of Islamic teachings and traditions. So today, Africa finds itself at a crossroads because free inquiry is under assault. Yes, 
You can't say what you think. You can't ask questions. You, you won't like to interrogate. What, who wrote the Quran? Where? How? How did Prophet Muhammad, how did Muhammad become a prophet? You know, prophet of who? Why should people, people need to investigate because a lot of people have uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad as their model. And sometimes they do a lot of harm to the society. So it's important to investigate and find out about his life. Now, the culture of free expression is threatened. From the remote corners of Northern Nigeria to other places in Africa where people cannot openly and publicly question ideas, religious ideas, free inquiry is under assault. From places like Mr. Balas Kano and Deborah, Deborah Samuel Sokoto State to Mohammed Sali Sudan, where people are attacked, imprisoned, or killed for expressing their views about Islam and his prophet, or for stating what they believe and not believe. The culture of freedom of expression, the culture of free expression is endangered. Now, in my remote village in Mbise in southern Nigeria, where I was born, and where many people still strongly believe that they could make money through ritual sacrifice of human heads and body and other body parts, free inquiry is under attack. From the remote communities of Konshisha in Benue, central Nigeria, to Kafaba in northern Ghana, and to other regions and provinces in Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, where people attribute poverty, illness, death, accidents, and thunderstorms to witchcraft, and in turn accuse people, attack, murder, lynch, and very alleged which is alive, free inquiry is under attack. Meanwhile, freedom of expression, free expression is necessary for African awakening and enlightenment. Free inquiry is imperative to combating and resisting extremism, religious extremism, superstition, and bigotry. So Africa needs a climate of critical inquiry and investigation of claims to dispel the dark and destructive hold of religion on the minds of the people. Very often we are told that ah, Africans are the most religious, you know, in the world. As if that is something we should applaud as, you know, as one, something we should be excited about. Nobody, you know, tries to investigate how is this harming Africa? How is it hampering African growth and development? We try to we, 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 we easily invoke this idea that yeah, Africans are deeply religious, as if it's actually something one should be proud of. If we do closer scrutiny of the situation, religion is having a lot of damaging effect on the people. So the continent needs a culture of expression that frees and can free the society from the vicious grip of Islamic extremism and the bondage of dogmatic faith and suffocating orthodoxies. So early in this 21st century, Africans must rise up to the challenge of exercising, upholding, and defending the value of free inquiry or rage. So this is why what you are doing here at the center of inquiry is important to us and is important to humanity. Please keep it up. Thank you. All right, thank you, Leah. Um, does anyone have any questions? I can come around with the microphone, have a chance to ask Leo. Please raise your hand. Hi, um, what's the state, the Nigerian state's responsibility in the situation you've described? Yes. Not on, I'm sorry. Yeah, what happens is that in Muslim dominated sections of Nigeria, they say there is nothing like separation of mosque and state. Yeah. So the states, they go along with the clerics. In fact, the states are more or less subordinate 
to the religious Islamic establishment. So they are the ones, sorry. They are the ones paying the Sharia police. This is the Sharia police, they're paid by the state. So the, the states try to run government in line with Islam or Sharia, expressly, covertly, and overtly. So like uh, in the case of Mubarak, he was arrested by the state police. He was arrested by the state police. He was detained by the state police against the constitution because the police shouldn't have detained him for more than 48 hours. But they detained him for over 18 months. Yeah. So there's a lot of impunity, especially when it has to do with religion and when it has to do with Islam in Northern Nigeria. So this state is part and parcel of the whole oppression and persecution. Now, the is not is not illegal. You know what happens is that what the law says and what applies. There, there's this dichotomy. Okay, so in our constitution, you have freedom of religion or belief. Okay, but in practice, is not the case. Now, what happens is that in this case, now he left. What they tell us in practice is that even if you leave. You, just, you should just shut up. Don't speak out. Yes. Don't openly identify us. So in other words, as a, an atheist or, 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 or as a non-religious person, you are more or less a second-class citizen. You, you can be seen, but not heard. Yes. Okay. So, but we try to, you know, be heard because it is our right. So that's exactly what he's trying to do um, and all that. And they just want to what they want to, what they, what they have done in this case is just show an example, yes, so that no other person could do it, and that is why it's always difficult when you ask me how many atheists are in Nigeria. I tell journalists how many do you want them to kill or put in jail. That's that's what I ask answer them. Okay, yes, because many of them they they become endangered as soon as they start speaking out. But as soon as you keep quiet. And even sometimes still identify as a Muslim in the public records, and they know you are not a believer, really. They don't have problems with you. And but we can't we can't stay like that for too long. No. So that's why some of us are saying we have to come out, we have to begin the process of saying who we are and saying what we think. What what is the status of homosexuality in Nigeria now? Okay, um, it, it is is a crime. Yeah, homosexuality is a crime, and you know what happened is that it has always been a crime because Nigeria inherited this constitution from the British. They just cut and paste a lot of things, and because I'm sure they couldn't uh, go into the process of actually writing a con original constitution, so so they did that. And, um, you know, it was, things were a bit relaxed. You know, people knew they were homosexuals, okay? But uh, people were not going after them. But of course, when the wave of, you know, same-sex marriage, legalization, there was this kind of hype, you know, people started panicking. And they now sent a bill to the parliament to, to now uh, kind of make it illegal for uh, uh, homosexuals to marry. In, no homosexual, it was, was, uh, homosexual were not actually asking for marriage. They were only responding to something going on here, let's say in the West or something like that. They kind of, okay, we don't want this here. Even though we know that there are family members or friends, you know, who are homosexual. So that's a situation where we find ourselves. Now we have a law against same-sex marriage, even though we already have in our constitution something against homosexuality. So the situation is dangerous for homosexuals.
Hi, I would like to know what the campaign, um, what that involves as far as trying to free him. Is there, I don't know what the judicial system looks like. Is there a process to appeal something or is it more putting public pressure um, and raising awareness? Yeah, thank you. We are using both, okay? Because like, 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 he, like he told me when we were, ha we were having discussion, he said, look, why he pleaded guilty was that the questions the lawyer said, he would ask the state prosecutor. That is to annoy them. And when they get angry, they could come and kill him or kill him and the lawyer together. They would come and attack and kill him. So to avoid that process, he now pleaded guilty. But of course, it has made the appeal process more complicated, according to the lawyers. And in fact, a lot of people actually moved back. Even some people called me and said, okay, Leo, you can see it now. You guys have been doing this and that. Look at this situation. Look at the outcome. Then when I met him, he explained and I agreed with him. Okay? Yeah. So, but it has made the appeal process, you know, very complicated according to the lawyers. But we're appealing the judgment because they said post, the post he made, he wasn't even living in Kano where they went, but they took him to Kano because that's where they could actually hold him the way they held him, you know, without anybody coming for him until he pleaded guilty, then they had to release him. You know, they, they imprisoned him, then we were able to transfer him out of Kano and all that. So why we appeal the judgment? So uh, we are not expecting, we don't know, hopefully, but at the first appeal level, we might get reduction of sentence, the sentence, maybe, because 24 years, maybe. Uh, but we, we, we plan to go up to the Supreme Court because that is exactly where we are going to know not just the status of his case, but also the issue of blasphemy, okay? So we are trying the legal process. But our legal process is also as encumbered by religion as the political process. So, but we're also trying to lobby the politicians and say, okay, can you grant a state pardon or can you do other things? So we are, we are using both the political advocacy approach we're also trying to pursue it through through the courts yeah so you you mentioned during your talk the 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 women in the picture yeah here, they were kidnapped yes so how how did that happen? Did they go around and just round up a whole bunch of women at the same time? Like, how were they kidnapped and what, did, what were they forced to do? Well, of course, as we were told, you know, they look for soft targets, these extremists, okay? So, and in Nigeria, it's difficult to know who is an extremist and who is not because they don't go with any special ID or something. So they go around, monitor some very places that where the security is porous. They went to a school a girl's school and took, you know, took them and it happened at night, you know, bundled them into, the, into their vehicle. And I think they went into a forest. And then now I, we are told that, you know, they scattered them, they put them here and there. So we, um, some were released, but many are still unaccounted for. So, and it's been going on. So we really don't know. People keep asking me about statistics in Nigeria. And I, I tell them, I'm sorry. Is uh, the situation is that we don't actually have records of these things. Yes, because when people are born, there are no, uh, there are structures to record them, but nobody, nobody has this record. So it's difficult to say exactly the number that have been released and the number of people have been kidnapped to join these people or where they are. So that was what they did. They took them away. I think took them somewhere. They took this photograph, you know, and sent it to the government. Of course, to let the government understand that, you know, get into negotiating with them and understand that they're also having impact and all that. So that was what we we're told. They came in the night, used their trucks and took these girls away. But through the campaign, some have been released, but some are still un un unaccounted for right now. Um, you were saying that there's a what is written in the constitution right versus how it's getting applied. Um, so given, I don't really know the history, given the history, was the government always this strict or did it get worse? 
or in the future, do you think it, there might be a chance? How do you predict if you compare the history and where you are now, and then given the future, um, where do you think it, this will go? Yeah, where are we going from here? Yes, I mean, it's, it's difficult to say, okay? It's difficult to say, but from the way things are getting worse, Yes, things are getting worse. Because we had a meeting, we had our humanist first meeting we held in Abuja. Abuja is at the center of Nigeria. You know, up north, up this way, you have the north, the northern part. Down, you have the southern part. Abuja is being at the center. So we took our convention to Abuja. And a lot of ex Muslims, many ex Muslims came around. But we can't do that now. Yeah, we can't do it now. Because many of them would not come. They would not attend. Even some did not attend that very event. Now, the situation is worse now because they, they have been threatening them. They have been saying that compiling the list of those who are going to go the same way with Mubarak and all that. So a lot of people have gone on the ground. So on our side, the situation is getting worse. Okay. But another side of it is that the world has become more of a global village. So if you try to tackle somebody in Nigeria, a lot of people outside the world will come after you, unlike in the 90s or 80s, when those days when we started, when I send a letter to free inquiry, it takes about three months for me to get a reply. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but today it takes seconds <laughs> or minutes. So things have changed on one side. And now if this had happened, if Mubarak was arrested, let's say in the 90s or 80s, I may not have heard about it. He would have maybe either died or before I even get to know that somebody was arrested, if I even get to hear that at all. But I, I was informed the minute he was taken away. Yes. And we started following it and all that. So that's why sometimes when I try to talk about where we are going, predictions about the future, I'm a bit ambivalent. Because while certain things have gotten worse, there are also some advantages we have so that today they now know that we are not just that kind of group you could just come and pick us up that way and get away with it yes people will ask in fact the u.s government has been involved and i must say this to their credit and i'm saying it here on record that i have never i never envisaged the level of support we have gotten from the united states government they have been in touch you know in fact they had a very a diplomat that was constantly in touch. Two, every two days, she calls. What's the situation? What can we do? We were exploring all the options just to make sure we get this guy out. Of course, she told me the limits. Mubarak is not an American citizen. So there's a limit to what they could do as an embassy. But I must tell you, the American government has been supportive. And in fact, when we, they were threatening us, we just... We just agreed that, you know, if they come for anybody, just run into any American embassy or any American property and, and we, get, we take it up from there. So we had the American embassy spaces and facilities as a place we could run to if things get so bad. Because it was during the lockdown and, you know, during that lockdown, there wasn't this kind of movement and all that. So they could just come down and attack you. So we just had it. We had to, the EU embassies and American embassy facilities were something we said we could go there maybe those who can those who could go there should go there so that we could get some protection so so yes uh, on that in that area we've we've had some development that we found you know quite supportive and now there's this trend to abolish or repeal blasphemy laws the campaign to repeal blasphemy laws and a lot of governments like the EU and American government have also been supportive in that respect so in some, in some areas, things are getting, seem to be getting worse. In other areas, there are resources, there are mechanisms that is giving one a sense of hope that things could get better. Sorry, I have another question. Um, yeah. Should he be freed? six months from now he would be free mm -hmm. would he be safe or would he need to try to apply for asylum somewhere i i have to imagine even if he were to be out of 
prison that he could still be in grave danger. Yes, he will. He will be in grave danger. And we have also discussed this, you know, because initially, you know, when he had the daughter, when, when he had the, you know, daughter case, that was in 2014, when he came out and they took him to hospital, it was discussed that he should go on asylum, but he refused. Yes, he didn't. Even right now, he seemed to be having a discussion whether to go, but I told him we won't talk about that when he's still in prison. Let him come out first, okay? And all that. But we are ready for that. And I want to also say that American government is also, uh, it's not like they have agreed, but it is something that they're looking at with a lot of uh, a sense of support in case we have it. So um, right now, if he comes out, he's going into asylum straight, no discussion. But uh, he's, he's a bit ambivalent about it. But for us, it's not something we have to discuss. He has to go into asylum. Even if it means going to, uh, is it a second country or a third country? You know, not the United States, but somewhere else. But he will, he will definitely leave Nigeria. So, because I told him that he has to leave so that I could focus on other things. <laughs> because I have not done anything meaningful since, <laughs> since 2020. And in fact, I had a postdoc position and my professors were like, okay, you are more interested in this Mubarak's case than you are in this thing. And actually, I've always been more interested because I felt that if we don't fix this, if we don't really give this, you know, a kind of our best, they will set a precedent that will come to hunt everybody, even including me. Yeah, they must not wait. There was that saying that you don't wait for them to come for you before you start speaking out, okay? So I felt that that's what we needed to do. So I just told him, I said, look, man, you, go, you have to go so that I can face my life and face something else. So he will go, yeah. <laughs> Um, you had mentioned that the Nigerian constitution was based on a, on a British model mm -hmm. and Islam came to Nigeria well after Before. the fact. Yeah. And Islam exerts Sharia law. Mm -hmm. But does the Nigerian constitution just sanction it? Does it allow that to happen? I mean, is there like a separation of church and state in your country? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very important question. The the issue of the place of Sharia law within the Nigerian constitution has been a very difficult issue. Now, um, when some Nigerian representatives met in the 70s to look at the constitution, to draft a new constitution, they rejected the recognition of Sharia law. And the Muslim delegate, they walked out of the assembly. They just take the walk out. So, because they said there cannot be a part of a Nigeria where Sharia is not recognized. Now, how, where do you place it? So they now said, okay, Sharia should apply to personal laws, you know, domestic issues and all that. But they were still not satisfied with that. And that was why in 1999, a governor from one of the states unilaterally introduced the criminal aspect. And in fact, had to amputate somebody who stole a goat. Yes, an animal. Amputated, they, they, they amputated the, the, the person, removed the arm and all that. So, and there have been other cases like that judged based on Sharia criminal code. So it, 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 there, there, was, there were many riots, killings, and the Muslims insisted that they must go ahead with the full Sharia. That's what they said they wanted. They didn't want just the personal domestic part, family part. No, they wanted it from full. So Nigeria is neither here nor there. So you have a constitution that says personal family laws will go by the Islamic religious uh, you know, dictates. But in practice, you have states enforcing the criminal, um, um, the criminal Sharia aspects. So, and nobody can, if you try to oppose it, you say you're opposing Islam, you're opposing Allah, and you could be killed. You can't win election and all that. So, yeah, Nigeria is just in a very messy situation, I must tell you. So, and it's important we tell ourselves the truth. So the constitution is just like a paper tiger, you know, of no much effect because the Sharia applies in the North and um, customary law and all that apply in the South. So that is where we are in terms of practice, constitutional practice, that's where we are, yeah. 
Could you say a little bit about the, the Humanist Association, uh, its her history and current status and how you see its future? Yeah, um, yeah, you know, saying, uh, saying something about the future of an association whose president is in jail, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, well, the fact there is that Many Niger Nigeria, Niger uh, humanism has a lot of future prospects in Nigeria. If the fanatics, if the jihadists, if the Islamists, if the, if the theocrats allow, because they are holding Nigeria hostage, like I said in my presentation, okay? So a lot of Nigerians subscribe to humanist values, but there is no space for them to really express and manifest it. So they try to restrict the humanist space. And that was exactly why I started the Humanist Association, because I knew very well that Nigeria needs that space. But it's going to be a lot of challenge. And with what we are seeing now, there will be, there's a lot of risk associated with being a humanist and being expressly and openly a humanist in Nigeria. But the question is this, could we, because of that now said, you are not? Yeah, because... A lot of people come out and say, oh, I'm a Muslim. Oh, I believe in Allah. Oh, I believe in... But I also have to say what I believe. Yeah. So the question there is, what are we going to do about it? So we have to find a way to keep negotiating our existence, our survival. Like now, we cannot hold meetings in Northern Nigeria. In fact, they were threatening us before now. Anywhere they have a sign that Mubarak was trying to organize any event, they will quickly send information. They say they will attack the people. So people have gone underground. But again, we have the social media, you know, so a lot of things are going on virtually. But like Mubarak's case has shown, they are also there trying to know what you're posting, trying to know the comments you're making and all that. So yeah, there is no, one cannot actually say what the future is like, but like I said, a lot of also has changed. You know, a lot of people, you know, do a lot of things virtually now. And like now we wanted to have a census. That was in, in, in that's this month, in May, that, that's this month. But in the census, they said that they were not going to include any question on religion or ethnicity. What's the purpose? Why? Because they don't want to give opportunity for people to identify themselves as anything other than what is the case now. Because when you read it, they say, oh, Nigeria is 50% Muslim, 40%. They were like that when I was born. They were like that 30 years ago, 20 years ago today. I mean, come on now. <laughs> Every time, 50% Muslim, 40% Christian. What kind of, oh, are, we, are, we, are we like chairs? You are arranged on the, on, in a hall. No. But now, they, 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 they refuse to include questions on religion. So people cannot understand the shifts in terms of religious belief and unbelief and all that. But the question again is, for how long are you going to hold people hostage? Now, today, a lot of people do things from their bedrooms and uh, you know, through their phones and things like that. So it is a challenge. But I still think that at the end of the day, you know, when people are holding you, at a point, the people holding you get tired. So they will get tired and will be free. So uh, the majority religion in Nigeria is Islam. Um, Islam. And I mean, it's hard to say. You said because no statistics, no reliable right. statistics. Okay. Now, on the surface, Islam and Christianity. Now, in the Islam-dominated areas, they try to suppress the Christian demographics, and of course, non-religious at the same time. So, so at the surface, is Islam and Christianity. They keep competing for dominance, but people practice a mix of traditional religion and Christianity, traditional religion and Islam, sometimes traditional religion, Islam and Christianity. <laughs> yes. So it depends on where you find yourself. It depends on, you know, because if you find yourself in some areas in rural communities, they practice whatever applies, whatever they can get and all that. So, so that's that's the that's the that's what the religious spread is like at the moment. I have a mm -hmm. follow-up question. Um, do the Islam extremists who are 
persecuting the non-religious? Do they also persecute Christians? Yes, they do. They are the ones that uh, they are the ones that uh, they are the ones that kill these people. And again, in 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 Nigeria, it's always difficult to draw a fine line between extremists and people you can identify as mainstream Muslims. Yes, because it's always difficult for us in practice. Okay, so because the people that okay, look at the young man there. That guy there, I don't think he's up to thirty years. If he's up to 20, I'm talking about a person using the matches box. So if somebody at this age in a school, is a college, they could go and lynch their colleague. So you can, you can imagine when you say extremist. So by extension, you, it's difficult to, if you remove the extremists, I don't know how many Muslims that will be left. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> to get it. So that is the challenge we have. And also the killing. This is this man was he was killed. He wasn't killed by people who really monitored him. Sometimes by his neighbors. There was a woman. She was killed in the market because they were doing their ablution, something they do before they pray. And I think they were doing it in a way that the water was splattering and all that. He, she just made a comment. They said he, you know he was insulting their religion and all that. They killed they killed her right there, and nobody was arrested up to today. So. In Nigeria, it's difficult to draw a fine line between Islamic extremism and other people. So if you are lucky, now let me give you this example. In the South, one Christian, enthusiastic Christian lady went into a mosque and as Muslims were praying, she just stood up and told them to give their life to Christ. Okay? That was in the South. So what they did, they really a kind of gathered and dragged, took out of the mosque and all that. So I have a friend of mine who comes from the northern part. So I asked him, I knew the answer actually, but I just asked him, I said, if this happened in a mosque in northern Nigeria, what will, what will happen? He said they will kill him, will kill her there immediately. <laughs> she, the way she said it, she didn't even, <laughs> you know, pause. She said they will kill her on that side, that spot. So, Islamic extremism is mainstreamed <laughs> in Nigeria. And that is why we have the problem. That's why Boko Haram is there. And that is why they could just put this guy in jail and, and forget him for almost two years. So, and we need to tell ourselves the truth. Because that's, this is, what, this is why, what I told you know, colleagues, Eric and um, uh, Kenny, that when they have arrested Mubarak, I said, okay, now we are going to tell the world how we are practicing your Islam here. Yes. So it's mainstream. And until we try to combat that, you know, and put in place, you know, and a form of Islam that can coexist with others, including non-religious others, dissenting others, critical others, Nigeria will not make progress. Yes, I say it because we are mixed. There's no majority per se, no religious majority per se. So what they worship, I never saw a mosque until I was in my 20s. I never saw a mosque. I grew up in the South. And we used to see Islam as a distant religion. So a lot of people you know, in Nigeria are, are not Muslims and they want to go about their business that way. So no, no religion can actually gain the kind of dominance to actually perpetrate these crimes. You know? So that is the challenge Nigeria has. And until they put in place, what they stated in their constitution, which is no part of the country should adopt any religion and state religion. That is in our constitution. But that is what is the constitution. In practice, in Muslim majority states, they adopted Sharia, they adopted Islam, okay? So until they resolve this kind of confusion, until they resolve this kind of dichotomy between what is said in the constitution and what is in practice, Nigeria will not make progress. I'm sorry, that is the situation. Hi, uh, you mentioned that uh, Islam is an outside religion for Nigeria. Uh, I was wondering how well versed are Nigerians about Islam? Like, are they familiar with the scripture where they can make an informed decision of whether or not they want to follow the religion? Or is it mostly like gets passed down from family to kids and then whoever co comes Job, after them? Help me. You know, I need to understand, maybe speak a bit slowly. Or... Yeah. Uh, 
you mentioned Islam being an outside religion. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's and, uh, from outside. Yes. Yes, I was wondering how well versed uh, Nigerians are about the scripture of Islam. Uh, are they like following it blindly for the most part, or are they familiar with what's in it? And like, are they making an informed decision? So I was, yeah, I was wondering about that. Yeah, how how familiar are they with the script Islamic sacred text? Yeah. Yes. You know, look, I, I was discussing with our colleagues before before now that okay. A woman visited our humanist stand some time ago and she was going through the literature. And most of those literatures, we got them from Center for Inquiry, so for you to know. So Ibn Warak's book, Why I'm Not a Muslim, okay? So, um, so after that, she told me that before she, she started to think and reason, she had memorized the Quran. And that she found it difficult to think outside the Quran. Now, immediately children are born, they take them to Quranic schools. And there they memorize this text. And this text, they contain verses that incite, that are insightful, that enjoin or injunct Muslim to attack and kill non-believers. Yes. So, a lot of them blindly follow this because you know they are not allowed to think outside that they are not allowed to explore any other thing outside that and they're not even they're not even made they're made to see other religions and philosophy as inferior this is what i said here so they are made to see their own as the best and the all and the ultimate and you know the culmination of everything so they come out with this idea that yeah Anything you are saying is either inferior to what they know or what they're told, or it has to be eliminated to, uh, to stop it from polluting what they have been told. So apparently, many of them follow this blindly. And this is the, this is the impact it's having on the country. So that they justify bloodletting, killing, and attacking people, especially when you try to question those things that have been made over the years, not to question and to see as something that they will, that should be respected, whether you believe or not. And when they say respect, they mean that you shouldn't challenge it. You shouldn't question it. You shouldn't doubt it. And even if you doubt it, don't openly do so. So that is the thing. Sometimes they know that you don't agree with what they're saying but you won't say it out, you are fine. But when you start saying it out, that's when they say they, they can take laws into their hands. And you ask yourself, which laws? Okay. Um, quick question regarding the South. You said you lived there and didn't see a mosque yeah. um, in the South. So are you saying therefore that in the South, which I'm guessing was Christian, mm-hmm. you said they follow customary law? Yes. In the South. Yes. So again, my same question I had before, mm-hmm. what's the state's responsibility? If they're following customary law, mm. that wouldn't be a secular state. Mm. Um, and there it seems to me there would be a lot of um, issues in terms of customary law mm. and certain kinds of rights and mm. um, the power of uh, the Christian church mm. Mm. Um, in the South, mm. I think is also probably mm. an issue, but yeah, yeah, anyway. yeah. There are issues. Yeah. There are issues. The fact there is that the customary laws are meant to be subordinate to the national laws. That is, when 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 you go to customary court and you are not satisfied with the ruling of the customary court, you have to appeal it, and they now look at it in the light of what they call the state laws. Yes, so. There is Nigerian constitution, like I said, is, is like something cobbled together, okay? And it has a problem, and like I've said, okay? But they try to accommodate some of this in order to get a constitution that people will agree to, because otherwise there'll be no agreement. Now, these people in the North accepted a kind of Sharia was like their own customary law, especially for Muslims. Now, for non-Muslims, they now accepted what they call customary law, 
well, some kind of tautology there, but in Nigeria, we understand that. If you're a Muslim, you go by the Sharia law, personal laws. But if you are not a Muslim, you go by what they call customary law, because there we are, all these communities have different laws of inheritance and all that, which sometimes are patriarchal. Yes, like inheritance of land is patriarchal. So what you do is that you now take it to the state higher court to challenge it on the basis of human rights and, and all that. Then they will now come up with a ruling that will set a precedent that will be used. So there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of um, conflict here and there, but very often they rely on the interpretation of the judges, especially the state judges at a very high level. So when they make that pronouncement, it will set a precedent for subsequent dealings of such issues. So we have that. The customary laws are, the customary laws, you know, uh, they sanction polygamy. You can marry more than one wife under customary law. But you can chat, the people who are part of that marriage can decide to challenge it or not challenge it if they want. If they, if they, if they don't want to challenge it, they go by it. If they, want to, if they want to challenge it, then the court is there to you know, protect their rights. But it's always, it's always uh, tough. Yeah. Um, you you um, help all these people and you're reaching out and and you're being that person. What protects you being Nigerian? Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, if you are to be a believer, a believer will tell you, oh, he's God. Well, you know, <laughs> what protects me? Now, well, the thing is this, and like I've always said, first of all, Nigeria is my society. I grew up there, okay? And um, I, it took me some time and it takes me from daily, weekly, monthly review to keep doing what I'm doing. And when I think about it, I still come up and I still think that I want to do what I'm doing and I want to keep doing what I'm doing. Now, there are risks, but I don't think that I'm more at risk than this, this man who was slaughtered in and killed. Or Deborah, innocent girl who just made a comment. And from there, that was the end of her life. So I feel there's a, there's, there's a need for us to do something. My society is drifting. And I'm seeing it, they are drifting. So there's a need for me, even if I, I try to hold something. This is an effort to hold my society, to pull it back. Yes. So it is a risk worth taking. And like I saw some of our friends, I actually don't think about this. The first thing I think is, what do you do to stop this? It's like when the house is on fire and you're asking, how do you protect yourself? Nigerian house is on fire. Yes. So what we are trying to do is to use all only means or mechanism to put off the fire. But of course, as you try to put off the fire, they keep setting fire here and there, you look back again, there's fire. So we keep doing it that way. So that if, for instance, tomorrow or sometime you hear that the firefighter is gone, you know that he, he dies putting up the fire. Yes. So the next thing is to run away. Where am I running to? I did my PhD six years in Germany. And for me, I'll be useless. My mind will still be there. And when these things are happening, I will wish I will be there. Now, I was happy. I told everybody who cares to know. I was happy that I was in Nigeria when I arrested Mubarak. Because I put my feet on the ground. I said, well, I will give this a fight. And I'm happy. I've done that. We have not succeeded, but we have given it a fight. So my Nigerian house is on fire. And African house is on fire. Look, in Malawi, they still stone alleged witches to death. I'm not saying 10 years ago. I said last year. They bury them alive. Come on now. And I come from there. They buried somebody alive, alleged witch alive in Nigeria some weeks ago, within this year. And you know, and, and you are talking about my protection when they're burying people alive around me. <laughs> what kind of protection do you need? The situation is bad. So we, could, we should just, you know, even if you have any protection, throw it away and get in there. So that's exactly what is going on. So, and when I say it, I mean it. 
And that's why some, you know, some of us have known me for so many years because I saw this fire and I saw people igniting this fire in different sectors, educational sector, legal sector. Like now, we're doing election. Nobody is asking who fixes the economy. Our economy is in tatters. Who gets the children back to school? They're saying, okay, is the president a Muslim or a Christian? Will they get a vice president who is a Muslim or a Christian? How does that fix the country? Look at it. How? Now, you go to police stations to report cases like this. They think you are disturbing them. In fact, that we went to a police station while I was here. They told us to give them money, give them serviceable vehicle. You know, they have a way of speaking fine English to support rubbish and bribery and corruption. I said, how can I give you a serviceable vehicle? I don't, am I Honda? I, I don't sell cars. You get it? We don't sell cars. We are an NGO. Poli the police were demanding serviceable vehicle from us. Of course, that is another name for bribe and the money. They are not demanding for vehicle in the ring sense. Even if you bring the vehicle, they will not take it. Okay? So my house is on fire. And I want to tell you, and I mean it. And the people who are supposed to help put off the fire are even contributing to the problem. So I think that the best way I can actually live, I can actually protect myself, is by fighting this. So the analogy you give about, you know, there's a fire and then there's more fires lit. Do you ever feel like when you put out one fire and the fact that there's another fire that comes up right behind it, do you ever feel like what you're doing it's, isn't? It's tired. It's useless, yeah? Do I feel that way, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, okay. The thing is, there's a tendency to have that feeling. Yeah. Because a lot of people think that somebody told me, Leo, do you think you can? Stop this. Do you think you can win this battle? But you, do you know what? I used to tell people that I didn't actually set up because sometimes they ask me, how many are you? How can you get this? But let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me give you this example. A young girl. I think I should. It should be the last slide. Yeah. This girl. In May, so, sorry, this is May. That was last month, 15th, April, in April. They set up this fire, torturing her to confess, to admit that she was a witch. She got burnt. She had burnt from the side. That's the one that was close to that fire. She got burnt. So somebody told somebody, somebody called somebody, they, they reached out to us. And we moved in. Invited the police. They asked for money. We appealed. They asked for serviceable vehicle. When I was talking about serviceable vehicle, it's the police with regard to this case. So we told them we'll fuel the car. But we want to make sure the person who set this fire, who set up this fire, the person is arrested. So we're able to do that. And they got back thanking us, you know, being grateful and all that. And we have done that on one occasion, two occasions, three four, five occasions. And today, I might go into my email box now, there is there's an me urgent message. I'll, my telephone, there was one, we were just having a dinner one evening in a hotel, my phone rang. Somebody was, up, some children abducted their mother, took her into the booth because they wanted her to go for exorcism in a church, but she was afraid that they could torture and kill her there and all that. She refused, so they abducted her and took her, threatening. So we moved in, and the woman was rescued. So it's not always like the fire coming up. We, we are putting off some, okay? We're putting off some. And we are still asking ourselves, is there a way we can get a, a, a kind of a, a mechanism that will now be putting off the fire faster than those who are setting up the fire, okay? So we are making some progress, but of course the development could be demoralizing, okay? So I try to focus on our success, not on the challenges. And I try to look at those who are putting on the fire. Should ask what happened to the people who put, who put up the fire we have extinguished. That what happened to them will happen to them. So I always wonder, 
I go on radio, I keep telling them, if you do this, this is where you are ending up. Look at this. So, so that, you know, sometimes some of them who may want to put on fire may stop. So at the end of the day, the idea of putting on the fire will, will start coming down because you have now through your message and publicity stopped people who would have set, you know, put, off, put on uh, fire or something like that. So this is my hope. This is my driver. This is what drives me. And again, yeah, if all of us start putting on fire, we are gone. So the logic of even putting on fire will burn even the people who are putting on the fire. You get it? So there is no way they can win. I keep telling them. It's either we, we win or we are gone. You get it? So that is what motivates me. And that is why even if I'm seeing the fire around and all that, I'll keep putting on as much as we can. And again, more people are coming on board. Out of the people I'm addressing address at this meeting are people I met putting on, uh, helping me to put, on, put off the fire. You get it? So a coalition, a lot of people are coming together. So that, I'm, uh, like I told my friends, I, I, I was speaking with the police when I was in the aircraft coming here. I was uh, united. I was using the um, Wi-Fi to chat with the police to go and arrest. You got to make sure to arrest the people who said this. So he was telling me I should come to his office. I said, no, I'm on my way to the United States. <laughs> yes. And I told him that I'm going to talk about what they're doing in Nigeria, in the States, that they, they should better sit up. So I'm using everything in my power to put on the fire and send a message of deterrence to all the people who are encouraging the fire that, first, this fire will burn all of us or you people should stop. So that is how I do it. Um, so social media is really helpful in your work? Yes, it is. It is because immediately you make that post, it goes around the world. It goes around, you know, and you see a lot of people coming, calling, trying to know, okay, what can we do? How can we support publicizing and all that? And, you know, they don't have that facility. Those who are putting on fire, they are being condemned. Of course, there are people who support them, who will say, ah, how are you sure this girl is not a witch? How are you sure she didn't do something and all that? But that thinning, because immediately you put this on social media, all the people in the West, they will start reacting and it's like, Leo, what's going on? You know, and start making some remarks in, in, in support. And only they start getting isolated. Okay. So social media, of course, has been helpful. And again, it's also helping us because sometimes when you tell people that this is going on, they don't believe it. A lot of people I spoke to in Connecticut and in, um, in, in, uh, that's in Massachusetts and all that, they were like, they don't believe that this has been going on. And I'm like, okay, maybe this place is not on social media or all that. I told them, click, just put a click. Put uh, witchcraft, Nigeria, burnings. You get it. So what I'm trying to say that social media have been helpful. And those are some of the things that also make me understand as I'm putting up the fire, I'm getting more and more fire fighting equipment. You know, I'll very soon I'll get a one that I will just do like this. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole fire will go, go off. So that is my hope because we have to put up the fire. That is it. I don't think there's any other choice. So, so that is why, you know, so, so that's my hope. That's what motivates me. Yeah. Any other questions? At the back. Yes. Sorry. Just one quick one. Um, the business about uh, witches, um, is that, are those practices um, related to indigenous uh, religious practices? Yes and no, okay? What happens is that Islam and Christianity demonize or dismiss traditional religious practices. Yes, so that traditional religious practitioners are oftentimes described as engaging in witchcraft, engaging in evil, demonic practices. In order to delegitimize them, and of course, create a space to legitimately impose Christianity or Islam, okay? So very often traditional religious symbols are identified as witchcraft symbols, not by the practitioners themselves, but by those who condemn the practice. Yes. So that if you put up 
a traditional religious ritual, they will think it is something you're using to harm. Because uh, any perceived supernatural harm easily gets blood into witchcraft. And the person responsible could be attacked or killed. So they, they have squeezed the traditional religious practice sometimes out of space. They have to squeeze them out so much or by demonizing them and making people to understand that it is evil to engage in those practices. So they have been at the receiving end of much of this. It is not, I'm not saying that the belief in witchcraft does not also exist within the discourse of indigenous religion. Because there are certain things that are associated with them. There are certain leaves or rituals. They say that if somebody is trying to bewitch you, you'd have to. So it's a narrative that exists within the indigenous religious practice. But the introduction of Christianity and Islam, Christianity especially is for the South, they have demonized this and think that it is just all about, they just painted it with a witchcraft brush. So that even ordinary religious symbols that they use is seen as a witchcraft material, what they use for um, you know, witchcraft purposes. There's somebody at the back. Hmm. Let's get one more. Ah, oh, yeah, so you had mentioned um, about national ID cards and identifying religions on that. And of course, um, things like that were used by colonizers in Rwanda to manufacture division in that country. So I guess, what do you think uh, the degree to which is that colonial legacy fuels or creates this kind of atmosphere where extremism like this can thrive? Yeah, you see, there is too much reference or over referencing of colonialism when you discuss African problems. And sometimes the message one gets is that Africans seem to have no agency, you know, when it comes to their issues. No, we're talking about Nigeria is about, what is that's in 1960. So we're talking about, uh, that's about um, 60, 63 years or 62, 63 years ago. So the question is that how long are we going to keep talking about colonial legacy? For me, is, is, is they use it as an excuse. Yes, like now, who set up this fire? Is it the colonialists? No, it's Nigerians themselves. Who is, do, who is doing that? The hitting the old woman. That woman was beaten to death and the body was sent ablaze, set ablaze, the cops. Who did that? So some of us who are born after, the, after independence, and who didn't actually experience the colonialism we are talking about. We keep asking ourselves, what is wrong? We should not excuse our stupidities. We should not excuse our inadequacies. Deliberate, we know that deliberate inadequacies and stupidity, we should not be using that. If, if the colonial legacy is not good, you change it, <laughs> you change it. <laughs> yes, yeah, and again, which country was not I was in Connecticut or so. Yeah, they were telling me about the war as we are coming, I think, from uh, Massachusetts to Connecticut. We stopped over at places where they say the revolution started, where they fought, where they fired. The, they were telling me some history associated with the fact that people rose up and said, Enough is enough. <laughs> so, when will Africa say, Enough is enough? Yes. When are, when are we going to say enough of this colonial legacy? If we don't like it, you change it. So uh, what I'm saying there, yes, there, were, there was an impact, which is not, which is expected. But today, Nigerians have been independent. They choose their own government. And when they choose their own government, they will now say, oh, because of colonial legacy, we are going to choose this uh, Muslim, Muslim, Christian, Muslim. No, now, no, no. So the time has come for us to rise above this colonial legacy and begin to build a government in line with our own yearnings and aspirations and stop making excuses. Yes, if the constitution we got is not good, you have opportunities to change them. Why don't you change them? You see it. And if you don't change them, don't blame the colonial 
or the colonial legacy, blame yourself. And this is exactly for me why I'm a humanist. Because the point I started taking responsibility for my actions and not blaming any God or spirit or devil, I think that that is the point I now begin to have a sense of control over my own destinies. Like they said, no, no, no destiny will save us. We have to save ourselves. Colonial legacy, if it didn't save you, then Nigerians, Africans should make efforts, change their government in line with the change or in line with ideas and values they aspire for themselves. For me, enough of blaming this colonial legacy. I don't think that is helpful at this time because it makes people think that Africans are powerless in the face of the challenges they face. I don't think they are. And even if we have that thought, we need to change it because we can really do something about our situation, including legacies that are not in line with our yearnings and aspiration as a people.